Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Oh, that's interesting. So, <clears throat> those of you driving around in our various communities, you've noticed a little change in the roadways, haven't you? What do you think of those roundabouts? I mean, we, what do you think of those, huh? You know, it's the British that came up with the idea. I think it's their way to get back at us. For, <laughs> it's true. The British came up with the idea of roundabouts. You see a lot of them in Europe. And, and honestly, for me, as my son will probably attest to, because, you know, it's the little things that always bring out the best in me. <laughs> Where's the remote? <laughs> It was a bit frustrating for me at first, adapting to them after years of, you know, intersections and traffic lights, right? That's what we've all are used to. But, you know, in linear thinking, the shortest distance is the straight line between two points, right? Yeah. It's a straight line. The, and uh, it's usually considered the quickest or the you know, the quickest way, but really, is it the quickest way? Is it the best way? A straight line. You know, driving in, in Southern California for the nine years that I, I lived there, you learn something very fast. You learn very quickly that the direct way is not always the best way. That sometimes, to get to where you are going, the better way is actually the long way around. And so it does not surprise me when our portion from this morning's parasha, Bashalach, tells us that God sometimes chooses the long or the roundabout way rather than a shorter, more direct way to get us to our destination. Our portion opens after Pharaoh had let the people go. God led the people by a roundabout route. Amen. And I have a sense this morning that some of us have been pretty frustrated. Some of us are frustrated. They're frustrated because you're doing the roundabout. And don't sing the song, okay? <laughs> you're doing the roundabout in your journey of life. And we find ourselves trapped in the biggest messes. Dealing with so much drama and unexpected situations, we end up on some of life's back roads. We find ourselves in dead-end alleys. We find ourselves in dry places of life. And we say to ourselves, is God truly leading me? And then his heavenly, maybe his heavenly GPS is broke or needs to be recalculated or I don't know how to follow, or I must be missing his will for my life, because here I am, detoured in life, disappointed by dead end, and frustrated by the dry places that I'm experiencing spiritually. How in the world can God be leading me when I end up in a place like this? Felt that way? Now, we experience a lot of unanticipated things along the road of life. I get that. And I'm Sure, many of you did in just this past year. And there are circumstances, plans just don't turn out the way you thought. And although you may wonder how we have ended up in such places, I'm here to assure you this morning that in all that chaos, God is leading you. God is leading you. So this morning, what I want us to consider are those detours, those dead ends, and those dry places that everyone here has faced in our life. You know, our portion tells us that when God led his people out, they bypassed the freeway, right? Right? If I wanted to go in the valley, when I was living in Beverly Hills, if I wanted to go in the valley, I used to go right up Wilshire, get on the 405 freeway, go up over the hill, over Mulholland, be down in the valley, and there it is. That's a direct freeway route. Now, nah. freeway six lanes, bumper to bumper. I'm, I'm going to get there like in Thursday, you know, or something, Right? So instead of going up the 405 freeway, I would go before the 405 freeway, and I'd turn right on Sepulveda, and I'd go a roundabout way, and I'd, and I'd finally get into the valley. A little longer, but quicker and more effective. That's right. I bypassed the freeway. 
Instead of the shorter route, more direct route, God led his people on a detour. He led them on a roundabout route through the desert by the Yam Suf, the Sea of Suf, or the Sea of Reeds, as some would call it. It wasn't a divine mistake. It was a divine detour. Remember, the shortest way may not be the best way. You see, God knew if he had taken them the straight way through the land of the Philistines, if they had, if, 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 if they had to face a war, they probably would have had second thoughts and headed back to Egypt, back into bondage and oppression. And no doubt they would have been frightened, they would have been dismayed, they would have been discouraged, and they would have been defeated. God is always ready for any battle that comes our way. That's not the issue, brothers and sisters. God might be ready, but the question is, are you ready for the battle? Are you equipped for the battle? You know, God has a specific purpose and calling for your life. No question about it. Intentions to bless you and to fill your life with goodness. That's God's will and desire for your life. I have come that you may have life, says Yeshua, and have it to the fullest. That's what he is proclaiming to each one of us in our lives. God has a place of fulfillment for you, and yet his divine GPS, instead of taking you directly there, may have you right now out in the wilderness seemingly going this way and then that way. And you wonder which way. You know, there, for some of you, like, you know, old, not like, you know, I'm not old, but, you know, you old people. <laughs> Just kidding. You might remember uh, Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Starship, the lead singer of that band was Grace Slick. She has not aged well. But anyway, Grace Slick. And uh, she wrote a song and this is one of the lines from the song. He says, we're so busy going from A to Z, we forget that there's 24 letters in between. It's a great line. I wish I wrote it. Now, you may think you have misunderstood God, or maybe you've missed his leading. But maybe that's, maybe that's not the case at all. He may have you right where he wants you to be because you're not ready. You're just not ready. Or he's preparing you for what is ahead. See, in order to be battle ready, you first need a strong faith. Did you catch the, the, the portion there? Did you catch the portion from the Vihashachim from Yahoo 7? Few will find it because it's a rough road. Now, none of you think that's you. Well, that's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Well, you might want to rethink it. There's some rough roads of life. Yeah. And it's a narrow way through those rough roads. And a lot of people bail. Ah, you know, no thanks. You know, I remember our, our trip. Remember our trip to St. Thomas? <laughs> those were some rough roads. You know, post-hurricane, we drove on some rough roads. No guardrails. Potholes that deep, driving a four-wheeler, you know, four-wheel drive up and around curves and stuff. Yeah, that was not for the faint of heart. But we did it. We did it. And I, I just wanted you to know that, that in order to be battle-ready, like I said, we have to have strong faith. And so what may be a detour to you is really preparation for what is yet to come for you. Well, you're being prepared for something that is about to come. God is leading you right where he wants you to be. The whole point of this passage is that God led them. He led them on a detour. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God may be doing the same for many of you. Did you happen to notice where he had led them? Did you notice? He led them into the desert. <laughs> the desert. Led them into the desert of the Sea of Suf. Whenever we experience God's deliverance, do you expect a desert? 
I've been delivered. Here I am in the desert. Thanks. Right? Right. <laughs> God help me, but there's a comedian from years ago, Sam Kinison. He did a whole bit on that, and it's absolutely hysterical. There's people in the desert. There's no food there. Don't send them food. Send them Samsonites in bags. Move where the food is. Right? You know. U-Hauls and trucks. He, we were delivered. God's people were delivered into the desert. And so what happens there? <laughs> now you, you face a whole new set of challenges and concerns. You know, you have to understand, brothers and sisters, this is a very, very important point in our walk with the Lord. When there is deliverance, there is a sojourn before you arrive at the promise. There's 24 letters in between. There's going to be a sojourn. God's people is an example of what that's all about. You don't get there right away. You face a whole new set of challenges and concerns. That was boot camp for Israel. That was boot camp for Israel. It was a place of drought. It was a place of discipline. It was a place of hardship. Dry, uncomfortable, unknown places are often, and you're not going to like this, but I don't care. <laughs> it's often what we need. It's what we need. You know, places like that are our training ground. But people of Israel, initially, they didn't understand that. But God understood because he knew that they were not ready for what was before them. And yes, they left Egypt. They were dressed or equipped for battle. The word tells us, but being dressed is one thing. Being ready is another Psalm 144, verse 1, King David, the warrior, what does he say? Blessed be Adonai, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He makes us ready. He trains us up. Ask a person who's been released from prison, who has just finished drug rehab, or a person who's been in an abusive relationship. They may be free, but are not prepared for freedom. That was one of the themes of the movie Shawshank Redemption. Remember Red? Couldn't handle freedom, so he hung himself. He wasn't ready for freedom. Perhaps you've been praying about a particular job or praying about a house you want to buy or praying about your date life or your lack of one or the person you will marry, or just wondering why you seem to be going around in circles all the time. Outwardly, you appear dressed in readiness, but inwardly, you're just not ready. I always tell a young person, you know, you know why can't I meet that special person or something? I say, well, are you somebody that, that special person wants to meet? <laughs> it's harsh, but it's true. Become the person that somebody would want. And then that special person will be there because God has already selected that person. Amen? Those are the tough words of love. Let me remind you that God is never in a hurry. I think most of us have pretty much learned that one. When he called Moshe, he led him to the backside of the desert for what, for 40 years before he was ready to serve God? When God called Shaul, the Apostle Paul, and he wasn't ready, God drew him into a season of deep devotion and ministry prep that lasted how long? 14 years. See, in this day, things are different, you know, and this is one of the problems right here. This is the problem because everything's now. Now. We want to find something out? Okay, Google. <laughs> right. That's, I knew I cracked up my son, but um, <laughs> God is never in a hurry. In this day, we worship achievement and knowledge. We tend to want to travel in straight lines, to know where we're going. We have all, want all the answers right. We want the answers now. We want to wait 
for any answers. Therefore, I believe it is significant that God doesn't always lead us in straight lines or to places where we know where we are going. And why would he do this? Why would he do this to us? To confuse us? To diminish or question our faith? Does he do this because he enjoys keeping us guessing? No, no. He leads us to these places to keep us depending upon him. If we knew everything, we wouldn't need God. You know, it's not so important that we always know where we are going, but that God knows (laughs) and that we follow him. Now, it could be that you are at some place where you ought not to be. Amen? I don't mean that so much physically, but maybe spiritually. You're at a place that you shouldn't be there. That you have not been listening very well to God or following his leading. When I talk about listening, it's shema. It's, 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 it's drawing that, voice, that inner voice. Listening, not physically listening, but hearing in your heart. Listening to God or following his leading. That might be the case for you know, some of you. I know often I'll tell you something from the Bema, and yet that problem will still exist in your life. I've already told you what the answer is. <laughs> you just refuse to listen to it. The answer is usually pretty darn clear. And that's why the problem consist- continues in your life. But it could also be that you're perfectly where God wants you to be. And though it seems to be a detour, Because he has something in mind for you that will keep you depending on him. And you don't have to know all that God knows. Or why is it that things aren't working out just the way you want them to or expect them to. Amen? It's not like the church teaches you where you rub the genie and you get what you want. Recite a few scriptures and God owes it to you. I'm just telling you. It just doesn't really work that way. Amen? God knows. And he may see some pristine in your life that you don't see. So your job is to keep your focus on Yeshua, seek him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and follow his lead wherever he may lead you. Amen? Amen? Now, not only did God lead the children of Israel on a detour, but if that isn't bad enough, and then he leads them into a dead end. A dead end. And so Yahweh said to Moshe, chapter 14, verses 1 to 4, tell the people of Israel to turn around and set up camp in front of the Piacharot, between Megdol and the sea, in front of Baal Tzaphon, camp opposite it by the sea. So nothing's changed. God is still leading them. And although detours are frustrating, how about a dead end? How about a dead end? They're worse. And I I know you all have a story, because everybody uses their GPSs now, right? You know, right? Could there be anything more exasperating and the GPS leading us to a dead end. There's no road here. <laughs> Why am I listening to you? You don't know where you're going. <laughs> right? Is that exasperating? Of course it is. Ending up in a dead end, that's their aggravation. Their aggravation is now turned to desperation because the Sea of Suf is before them and Pharaoh is behind them with his army. Their swords are shining in the sun and there's blood in their eyes. They were between the sword and the sea and they were terrified because they had nowhere to go. And yet God led them there. He put them there. What's the purpose of that? Because God was going to bring judgment upon Pharaoh. They never figured that part out. It was a woe is me moment. And we have those woe is me moments because we don't understand the big picture of things. 
We don't understand that there's more to the picture than just us. That God sees us as a body, as a community. And he's doing a greater work beyond what our own little finite minds can figure out sometimes. And then you had that moment afterwards. Oh, I get it. This is what God was doing. Well, where was your faith before you had that? Thomas. He's going to bring judgment upon Pharaoh, and he used B'nai Israel to bring Pharaoh to his knees. He baited his hook. He baited his hook with his people so that he would be glorified. How do I know? Because he said it. Verse 17, as for me, I will make the Egyptians hard-hearted, and they will march in after them. Thus I will win glory for myself. At the expense of Pharaoh and all his army, chariots, and cavalry. They thought it was just about getting free. God was going to take, not only provide them freedom, but he was going to take care of the pursuers. God had a purpose in leading his people to a dead end. God makes a way of escape, yes, but our issues often track us down and they corner us. Because we never defeated the pursuer. And those issues pursue us and pursue us and pursue us. And we don't deal with them. We just want to be free. I'll stop using today. (laughs) Anybody can stop using today. We got to figure out why he did to begin with. That's the issue. That's the issue. Why did you do what you did to begin with? And if you don't deal with that, it's going to continue to pursue you. In life, you're going to come to some situations that are not just aggravating. You're going to come right up to a place of desperation time and time again, and you won't see any way out. And there's no pastor or rabbi who can give you a sermon that will provide that way out. There's no Christian author whose book gives you a way out. There's no prophet or prophetess that will prophesy your way out. There's no counsel that gives you a way out. You are just there, and there's no human way out. And that's the point. But when you come to that place, friends, there's no panic in heaven. They're not panicking. Never once has heaven been surprised at what's happening in your life on earth. God knew exactly what he was doing. Now, the people of Israel didn't know what he was doing, but God did. And the point is that they had not missed God or disobeyed him that they found themselves in this dilemma. No, they were right in the center of God's will. They were following God's lead. It's just God's lead brought them on a detour and into a dead end. And it's tough for us to accept that because we sort of make up our minds what the right way to do things is. Well, this is how I have figured out, God. This is how it will (laughs) work. No, no, no. No, I got a different plan. So just just follow my lead, right? God led them there so that the place of desperation would become the place of dependence. That we come to the place that when we see no way out, we cast ourselves completely, humbly, and totally on the Lord. And so chapter 14, Shemot, verse 13, Moshe answered the people, stop being so fearful. Remain steady. And you will see how Adonai is going to save you. He will do it today. Today you have seen the Egyptians, but you will never see them again. (laughs) You'll never see them again. That's why I've always had an issue with AA. Where is he going with that? Because you're always in recovery. Always in recovery. That was one of my first papers in seminary, challenging AA. It doesn't make any sense because if you're always in recovery, that means that God can't deliver you. God can't deliver you. What, that's what you're saying. He's not capable of doing that. Amen? I don't want to see that ever again. (laughs) I don't want to see the Egyptians anymore in my life. I don't want to be pursued anymore in my life with those temptations. I don't want it. And that's what God was doing for B'nai Israel, and that's what God could do for you. 
no matter what it is that pursues you. God brought them to a place of desperation so they would depend on God. So what is the purpose of that dead end in your life? What do you think God wants to do in your life? Well, first of all, he wants you to stop being fearful. Stand still. And why don't you give God the opportunity to save you? Amen? Why don't you give God the opportunity to save you? Yeshua is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. Let me ask you something. We lost a sister. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard for all of us. She was family. Right? Imagine what husband and daughter are going through. It's not easy. And we, somebody else might pass in our life, in our family, in our friends, our congregational family. It, it's going to happen. Ask yourself the question, will the passing of a loved one overshadow you this year? Fear not. Will you allow an illness or a disease to challenge your faith? Fear not. Will you allow an unexpected crisis interrupt your life? Fear not. No matter what your pain, no matter what your grief, your loss, your disappointment, your need, I'm here to tell you this morning, Yeshua is sufficient. Now, how many times have you heard this? And you know it's true, that in 365 times in the Bible, one form or another, the Bible says, fear not. Every day, it says, fear not. Fear not, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man may do to me. When there's no pastor who can help us, no rabbi that can help us, no book that can rescue us, no doctor who can heal us, no counselor who can fix us, no no broker who can prosper us, God says, fear not, hang on. Watch what I can do. Watch what I'll do. Do you know what God did with that dead end? He took it and opened a highway for them. The dead end became a highway. God knows a way for you. Do you have any mountains in your life that are immovable? Any rivers you feel you can't cross? Well, guess what? That's what God specializes in. That's right. I've always said people reach out... God, do a supernatural work in my life. No. You don't need God to do a supernatural work in your life because for God to do the supernatural, that's natural. Just do what you naturally do, God. What's in our eyes is supernatural. For God, it's like, what's the deal here? (laughs) I got this, you know, right? We see a dead end. He sees about 20 different ways to get out of it. That's natural for God. It's God's opportunity. He loves those opportunities to display his glory and his deliverance. It humbles us, but it also should make us very grateful. Very, very grateful. So dead ends, discipline and detours, but finally there's dry places. Dry places. A detour, a dead end, and a dry place. Chapter 15, verse 22, Moshe led Israel onward from the Sea of Suf. They went out into the sure desert. <laughs> desert again. But after traveling three days in the desert, well, of course, they found no water. No water. They aren't lost. No. God is still leading them three days into the wilderness, and now there's no water. Of course, the people didn't believe that. They weren't necessarily on board with Moshe at that point. They're a leader. They're weary. They're tired, hungry, thirsty. God has brought them here. And again, he has a purpose for them. When they came to this place in the desert, Marah, which everybody knows means bitterness, they couldn't drink the water there because it was bitter. They were parched. They were thirsty. It wasn't because... Moshe was a bad leader, or because God was mad at them, or because they had sinned, or because Hasatan did it. In your life, following Yeshua, you will come to detours. You will come to dead ends. You will come to dry places. It's likely God may be giving you 
dare I say that word that nobody likes, a test. Nobody likes tests. My hand goes up first. God tested B'nai Israel, and unfortunately, they failed miserably. Three days before, they were singing this song of Moshe, the song of the Lamb. Miriam, the women were dancing, and they were singing with, and shaking their tambourines, and, and now, now they're murmuring. They're murmuring against Moshe, but they weren't just against Moshe. They murmured against God. And when God leads you into a circumstance that is a detour and he leads you to a dead end or bitter waters and you murmur and complain, you are really murmuring against God and questioning his wisdom for your life. Why did they murmur? I mean, think about it. How many of you had a pillar of fire at night? Huh? Anybody have that, you know, lead the way for you? No, they did. God gave them a pillar of fire. Oh, did I mention the cloud by day? They had that too. And they had Moshe was there. God was leading them all the way. So why would they complain when they came to a place like that? Because there was a lack of trust. There was a lack of faith in God. And certainly a lack of common sense and reason. They hadn't really thought it through very well. Because if they stopped for a minute and thought about it, God had just brought them through the wilderness and had just delivered them from Pharaoh and opened the sea of stuff. That's some pretty good stuff. Be reasonable. Would God have brought them through the desert and the reed sea so wonderfully just to let them die without water? Doesn't make sense. Would God have so marvelously delivered them just to destroy them? That's an argument that God gave, well, Abraham gave to God, you know, dealing with Sodom and Gomorrah. It doesn't make any sense if you destroy them. You know. Now, here's a question. Actually, no, that would be Noah's Ark. I take that back. Correct, correct my theology. Now, here's a question. Do you think God would bring you as far as he has, sent his son to die for you, and now abandon you? No, of course not. He wouldn't do that. And even in the bitter places, the sufficiency of God is enough. God has not forsaken you. We read that, but I want you to own that. God has not forsaken you. He is prepping you. He's prepping you. Amen? Amen? Prepping you. I'm going to conclude with this. When God chooses not to take his liberated people directly home to the promised land through the land of the Plashines, but opts instead for a longer roundabout way through the desert, he tells us why. He tells us. God thought the people upon seeing war might change their minds and return to Egypt. Return to Egypt because there was food there and, and there was onions and all kinds of goodies. That's what they were saying. Untutored and unformed, confronted too quickly with the challenges of liberty, they might revert back to slavery. See, sometimes you have pursuers in your life, but sometimes it's you. <laughs> it's not that somebody's pursuing you. You just got scared with freedom, and you go run back to your bondage. Right. Woman with an abusive relationship, friend of yours, Abusive relationship. You can see it a mile away. You don't live it, but you're there. And then, and then she goes back to it. And you go, what the heck? God just delivered you out of that nonsense, that insanity, and you go back. And it happens all the time. So don't blame 
<laughs> Israel because they were thinking that. They were romancing the idea of going back. It'll be different this time. Right? Is that what we say? It'll be, no, 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 it'll be different this time. I don't know what I was thinking. It wasn't really so bad. Right? It wasn't so bad. For us to bearing the duties and the responsibilities of freedom without being prepared for it, it poses a lot of danger, especially the danger of abandoning our freedom in return for the presumed security or the passing pleasures and distractions of this world. Could it be not taking us directly from A to Z? God has, has prepared us through the practice of responsibility and through the formation and refinement of our character. Maybe that's happening. So look, when you're frustrated with life taking you the long way home, we all need to be reminded it's not for us to know. It's not for us to know what God knows. You're never going to know that. So just give up that fantasy fast. You're never going to know. Why would we need faith? Why would we need trust if we have all the answers, as I said? His ways, again, are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. The important thing for you in life is this, that you keep the eye of your spirit focused on the Mashiach. And then when the detours of life come your way, when you come right up to the dead ends and you face those dry places, fear not, be still, trust in the Lord. Expect, listen, brothers and sisters, expect real life to be this. Expect real life to be like a cross-country trip. Have we done those? Yeah, sure you have. Full of twists and turns. God is taking us in our life journey the roundabout way of faith through the wilderness. That is going to be what God does. Let's just accept that. Those 24 letters in between, let's accept that there's a lot of twists and turns that God's going to take you on because there are lessons to be learned, there's preparation that needs to happen, and there's a bigger picture that God is working out beyond just your own life. We may not know completely the way he is taking us. But here's my promise to you this Shabbat. You're going to get there. But you have to trust him. Please rise. Let's pray. Avina B'Shemayim, our Father in heaven. Yes, the shortest distance between two points is a straight, direct line. But what do we learn from that? Not much. Not much. Not much. So many of us, Lord, want to sprint through life. But Lord... Any of us who ever ran track, I did briefly. Life is more of a cross-country run. Around turns, up and down hills. And Father, sometimes it can be very exhausting. It can be painful. And especially, Father, if we don't know where we're really headed. We're just following you. But Lord, you promised us that you would get us there where you want us to be. And what are the places we possibly want to be, Lord, but where you want us to be doing what you want us to do? What could be better than that? We were made for a purpose, and the purpose is to be and do as you had designed us. So I pray in Yeshua's name, Father, that if there's any way that we have obstructed that process in our life, I pray that you would deliver us. And I pray, Father, that we would start the journey and understand, Father, that journey might take us in some dry places. And we might even hit a detour you know, or, a, or a, uh, an obstacle along the way. But nonetheless, you will, you, you, will, you will get us there. The dead ends of life, at least the ones that seem like dead ends, are not indicative of the bigger plan that you have for us. 
and you're just redirecting us, and you're doing a work, Father, that may very well be, Father, dealing with those pursuers in our life that are keeping us from meeting our destiny. So, Father, we thank you for your liberation, the liberation that we received in Yeshua. <coughs> Father, the price that he paid, because he sojourned as well, and his sojourn came to an end. That came on the tree. <coughs> but Father, because he went to the tree, we get to go to the promise. So thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name for the price that he paid on our behalf. And Lord, when we acknowledge that for our lives, then Father, we have the leader, the master that we need that will take us in the right direction. And we pray, Father, Lord, for those who have not received him in, his, in their hearts, that Father, this would be the day that it happens. That they submit wholly unto him and that he will lead their way now. We pray these things in Yeshua's name. The congregation agrees. Yivarech Yahweh v'yish merecha Tzadonai panavalecha v'chanecha Tzadonai panavalecha v'sim lecha shalom the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord to lift his countenance upon you and that he would grant you his shalom. B'Shem Yeshua Adonai, and the congregation says, Amen. Amen.